Hibernation 15. Grizzly's Growls presents Stories from the Hibernation. A handy guide for beggars, especially those of the poetic fraternity. Being sundry explorations made while afoot and penniless in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Kentucky, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. These adventures convey and illustrate the rules of beggary for poets and some others. By Rachel Lindsay These are the rules of the road. Keep away from cities. Keep away from the railroads. Have nothing to do with money and carry no baggage. Ask for dinner about a quarter after eleven. Ask for supper, lodging, and breakfast about a quarter of five. Travel alone. Be neat, deliberate, chaste, and civil. Preach the gospel of beauty. And without further parley, let us proceed to inculate these by illustration, precept, and dogma. Vecha Lindsay, Springfield, Illinois, November 1916. Part 1. Vagrant Adventures in the South. With a rose to Brunhilde. Brunhilde, with the young Norn soul that has no peace, and grim as those that spun the thread of life, give heed. Peace is concealed in every rose. And in these petals peace I bring, a jewel clearer than the dew, a perfume subtler than the breath of spring with which it circles you. Peace I have found asleep and awake. By many paths, on many a strand, peace overspreads the sky with stars. Peace is concealed within your hand. And when at night I clasp it there, I wonder how you would never know the strength you shed from fingertips, the treasure that consoles me so. Begin the art of finding peace, beloved. It is art, no less. Sometimes we find it hid beneath the orchards in their springtime dress. Sometimes one finds it in oak woods, sometimes in dazzling mountain snows, in books sometimes. But pray begin by finding it within a rose. Lady Iron Heels A story touching upon the romance of a long-dead florist. Also, the Canticle of the Rose. A note from the author. In the prose sketches in this book, I have allowed myself a storyteller's license only a little. Sometimes a considerable happening is introduced that came the day before or two days after. In some cases, the events of a week are told in reverse order. A Lady Iron Heels is obviously a story but embodies my exact impression of that region in a more compressed form than a notebook record could have done. Now, the other travel narratives are 99% literal fact and 1% abbreviation. Part 1. The Seven Suspicions One Saturday in May I was hurrying from mountainous North Carolina into mountainous Tennessee. Because of my speed and air of alarm, I was followed by the seven suspicions. I was either a revenue detective in pursuit of moonshiners, or a moonshiner pursued by revenue detectives, or a thief hurrying out of hot territory, or a deputy sheriff pursuing a thief, or a pretended non-combatant hurrying toward a Tennessee fruit, actually an armed recruit, or I had just killed my family's hereditary enemy and was eluding his avengers, or... I had bought some moonshine whiskey and was trying to get out of a bad region before nightfall. 
These suspicions implied that the inhabitants admired me. Yet I hurried. I came upon one article of my creed the very next day, Sunday, but Saturday was a season of panic, preparation, and trial. The article of my creed that I won as my reward might be stated in this fashion. Peace is to be found, even in a red and bleeding rose. I was accustomed to the feudist and the assassin. Such people have been good to me, and I was I walked calmly through their haunts. But now the smothering landscape seemed to double every natural fear. The hills were so steep and so close together that only the indomitable corn and rye climbed to the top to see the sun. The road was in the bed of a scolding rivulet. People in general traveled horseback. Cross logs for those afoot bridged high above the streams every half mile. There was a primeval something about the heavy chains of the cross logs binding them to the trees that suggested the forgotten beginning of an iron people, some harsh iron-willed Sparta. This impression was strengthened by the unpainted dwellings, hunched close to the path, with thick walls to resist siege. What first fixed these outlaws here is in a nest with a ring of houseless open country round them? A traveler was more shut from the horizon than, the, than in the slums of Chicago. The road climbed no summits. It writhed like a snake, and there were snakes sunning themselves on every other cross log, and there was never a flower to be seen. An old woman, kindly enough, gave this beggar a noon meal for the asking. But the landscape had struck into me, so I almost feared to eat the bread. For this fear I sternly blamed my perverse imagination. Refreshed in body only, I crept like a fascinated fly, dragged by a colt force toward a spider's den. I felt as though I had reached the very heart of the trap when I stepped into the streets of the profane village of Flag Pond, Tennessee. It was early in the afternoon. The uh, feudal warriors had come to the place on horseback, dressed in poverty-stricken Saturday finery, clothes tight and ill-dyed, black felt hats that should have slouched but did not. The immaculate rims stood out in queer precision. The wearers sat in front of the three main stores, looking across the street at one another. Since there was no woman in sight, everyone knew that the shooting might begin at any time. The silence was deadly as the silence of a plague. I checked my pace. I ambled in a leisurely way from store to store, inquiring the road to Cumberland Gap, the distance to Greenville, the, and the like. I was on the other side of the circle of dwellings pretty soon, followed by the seven suspicions shot from about seventy-five lean countenances, which makes about five hundred and twenty-five suspicions. One of the most indescribable and haunting things of that region was that all the women and children were dressed in a certain dead bone gray. Well, about four o'clock I had made good my escape. I had begun to mount rolling uninhabited hills. At twilight I entered a plain and felt a new kind of civilization round me. It would have been shabby in Indiana. Here it was glorious. They had whitewashed fences and white-painted cottages glimmering kindly through the dusk. Some farm machinery was rusting in the open. I climbed a last year's straw stack and slept with acres of stars pouring down peace. Part 2. The Tailor and the Florist And now the story begins all over again with the episode of the well-known tailor and the unknown florist. Just off the main street of Greenville, Tennessee, there is a log cabin with the century-old inscription, Andrew Johnson Taylor. That sign is the fittest monument to the indomitable but dubious man who could not cut the mantle of the rail splitter to fit him. I was told by the citizen of Greenville that there was a monument to their hero on the hill, so I climbed up. It was indeed wonderful. A weird, straddling archway supporting an obelisk. The archway also upheld two flaming funeral urns with buzzard contours and a stone eagle preparing to screech. There was a dog-eared scroll inscribed, His faith in the people never wavered. 
around all was, most appropriately, a spiked fence. But I was glad I came, because near the tailor's resting place was a florist's grave, on which depends the rest of this adventure, and which reaches back to the beginning of it. It had a wooden headstone, marked John Kenton of Flag Pond, florist, 1870 to 1900. And in testimony to his occupation, a great rose bush almost hid the inscription. Any man who could undertake to sell flowers in Flag Pond might have it said of him also, his faith in the people never wavered. And now in my tramping, the spirit of John Kenton or some other florist seemed to lead me. My season of panic, preparation, and trial was over. It was indeed Sunday on this planet for a while. I passed bush after bush of the same sort as that marking Kenton's place of sleep. The sight of them was all that I had to give me strength until noon. I had had neither breakfast nor supper. People would have fed this poor tramp, but I love sometimes the ecstasy that comes with a healthy fasting. And now that I reflect upon it, it was indeed appropriate that the religion of the rose should begin with abstinence. I have burdened you further back with an elaborate description of the landscape of Flag Pond. Now that landscape was repeated with the addition of roses. And what a difference they made. They quenched the seven suspicions. They made the gray dresses seem rather tolerable. On either side loomed the steepest cornfields yet, but they did not make me tremble now. At noon, I turned aside where a log cabin on stilts, leaning against its own chimney, stood astride a little gully. It was about as big as a dovecote. Straggling rose hedges led to the green banked spring at the foot of a ladder that took the place of steps. The old lady that came to the door was a dove in one respect only. She was dressed in gray. She was drawn to the pattern of the tub-like peasants of the German funny paper Simplicimus. I told her my name was Nicholas. She took it for granted that I wanted my dinner and asked me up the ladder without ado. She did an unusual thing. She began to talk family affairs. Oh, you must be kin to lawyer Nicholas of Flag Pond. He defended my son ten years ago in a trial for murder. I said, I I'm no kin to lawyer Nicholas, but I hope he won his case. No, my son's in the state prison for life. He surely kills Laura's Kenton. But she added, as if it nullified all guilt, they are both drunk. Well, she is busy cooking at the open fireplace, and she turned to the boy, about ten years older. Call your ma and your aunt to dinner. He climbed the steep and shouted. Presently, two figures came over the ridge. The larger woman took the boy's hand. That's my daughter-in-law, the boy's mother, said Mrs. Simplicimus. I judged the second figure to be a woman of about twenty-eight. She carried a fence rail on her shoulder. She was straight as an Indian. The old woman said, That's my daughter. She was going to marry John Kenton. Now, the only influences that it could have induced a mountain woman to unburden so much were the roses, just outside the door, leaping in the wind. The procession soon reached us, the wood carrier through the log into the yard. There's firewood, she sang. She vaulted over the fence, displaying iron-heeled brogans, thick red stockings, and a red-lined skirt. There was a smear of earth on cheek and chin. Her face was a sunburned, dust-mired rose leaf. She swept off her hat. She bowed ironically. She said, Howdy, what might be your name? I did not tell my name. She fell on her knees. She drank from her hands at the spring. I could feel the cold water warring with the sunshine in her sinews. She would have never done with splashing eyelids and ears and cheeks and red arms and throat. The rose bushes behind her leaped in the wind. The boy and his mother and the grandmother knelt at the same place and splashed after that same manner. And then the grandmother nudged me. Wash, she said. I washed. We climbed into that dovecote block house on stilts. We ate like four plow horses in a colt. We consumed cornbread and fat pork and then cornbread and beans and then cornbread and butter. I ate supper and breakfast and dinner in three quarters of an hour. Part 3. A Brief 
Siesta. Working a farm of fields that stand on edge without men to help and without much machinery makes women into warriors or kills them. The grandmother and mother were no longer women. Even when they caressed the boy, their faces were furrowed with invincible willpower. But Lady Ironheels was still a woman and was confused in the alternative of manhood or death. She was indeed a flower not yet torn to pieces by the wind, greatly shaken and therefore blooming the faster. There was a red ribbon streaming over the gray rag carpet. Lady Ironhill stooped, gave the ribbon a jerk, and a banjo came snarling from under the bed. She sat on the warring colors of the crazy quilt and played a dance tune, storming the floor with one heel. She grew pensive. She sang, We shall rest in the fair and happy land just across the evergreen shore. Sing the song of Moses and the Lamb by and by and dwell with Jesus evermore. Her neck had a yellow handkerchief around it. A brown lock swept across her leaping throat. Her cheeks and chin were bold as iron heels. Underneath the precious silken sunburn, the blood was beating, beating, and trying to thicken into manhood to fight off death. After the music, the ladies dipped snuff in the circle around the dim fire. Part 4. That's all the church I get. I made a great palaver to Iron Hills about giving me the banjo ribbon. She consented easily. Coquetry was not her specialty. "'What be your name?' she asked. "'Well, there was no dodging now. "'The old woman spoke up as though to save me pain. "'His name is Nicholas, but he's uh, no kin to lawyer Nicholas of Flagpond.' "'After a long silence, the girl said, "'We came from Flagpond once upon a time.' "'She had been looking out the door at the clear bowl of the spring "'and the reflection of the tall bushes leaping in the wind.' I thought to myself, she herself was John Kenton's chief rose. I thought he had her in mind when he set those ameliorating bushes through the wild. Possibly the girl could not read or write, yet she was royal. Democracy has the ways of a jackdaw. Democracy hides jewels in the ash heap. Democracy is infinitely whimsical. Every once in a while a changeling appears, not like any of the people around, a changeling whose real ancestors are aristocratic souls forgotten for centuries. As the girl's eyes narrowed, she became Queen Thai, the masterful and beautiful potentate of immemorial Egypt, whose face I have seen in a museum, carved in a canopic jar. She was Queen Thai only an instant, and then she became a Tennessee girl again with the eyes of weary doe. She said, them roses give me comfort. That's all the church I get. I asked, why are there so many roses between here and Greenville and none near Flag Pond? It was her turn not to speak. The old woman, as though to save her pain, answered, the flowers of all these parts were brought in by John Kenton. He lived in Flag Pond, but he could not sell them there. And the mother, the little boy, the man-woman whose husband had killed Kenton, broke her long silence. Only flowers we have today are those he brought. I think we would die without them. How do we get through the winter? Lady Iron Hills and her sister-in-law took a swig of whiskey from the jug under the table and lifted up their hose from the floor. The boy whimpered for a drink. They said, wait, wait till your man. All three climbed the hill. Lady Iron Hills was the last to go over the ridge. She saw me gather buds from both those bushes by the spring. She made a gesture of salute with her hoe. I never traveled that way again. I passed by quickly. Therefore, I had a glimpse of what she was intended to be. He that loseth his life shall find it. I see her many a time when I'm looking on Rose scattered leaves. She was a woman, God's chief rose for man. She was scorned and downtrodden, but radiant still. 
I am only saying that she wore the face of beauty when beauty rises above circumstance. The buds that I had gathered did not fall to pieces till I had passed by Daniel Boone's old trail on through Cumberland Gap, on over the big hill, Kentucky, into the blue grass. On the way I wrote this, their poor memorial, the canticle of the rose. It is an article of my creed that the petals of this flower of which we speak are a medicine, and that they can heal, almost heal, a mortal wound. The rose is so young of face and line, she appears so casually and humbly, we forget she is an ancient physician. Yet so much tradition is wrapped around her stalk, it is strange she is not a mummy. Her ashes can be found in the tombs of the pharaohs, in everlasting companionship with the ashes of the lotus and the papyrus plant. Her dust travels on every desert wind. No love song can do without her. No soldier and no priest can scorn her. There were the wars of the roses, and there was a rose in Sharon. Our wandering brother Dante found a great rose in paradise. There are white roses, sweet ghosts under the pine. There are yellow roses, little suns in the shadow. But the normal bloom is red, flushed with foolish odors, laughing, shaking off the gossamer years. She remembers love, but not too well, if love is pain. There is no yesterday that can daunt her and keep her dear heart laughter down. In springtime her magic petals bring God to the weary and give heaven's strength to the wavering of heart. She can turn the slave to a woman, the woman to something a little more than mortal. Oh, how bravely, with the same life-giving red, with the last of her virgin strength, she blooms and blooms on almost every highway. We find her on the road to Benares, on the road to Mecca, on the road to Rome, and on the road to nowhere in Tennessee. Her red petals can almost heal a mortal wound. Thanks for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Comment on the website at grizzly.libsyn.com. This program is sponsored by donations from people like you and is released with a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license.